This might be a football video, but I cannot just stick to sports. Marijuana overdoses kill over 150 billion people every single day. I myself just lost my cousin Doug to the nefarious plant last week. Be a hero and take a stand against the devil's lettuce by purchasing some of my marijuana overdose awareness merchandise. If you've already purchased some, purchase some more. We must destroy this evil leaf once and for all. The link is in the bio. Kansas City versus Las Vegas. This game proved once and for all that Patrick Mahomes is, in fact, a better quarterback than Jared Stidham. This was never even a contest. Mahomes kicked things off with a touchdown pass to Jarek McKinnon. Vegas responded with a field goal to make it 7-3 after 1. Then KC punched in back-to-back -back touchdowns on the ground to make it 21-3. But not before they did a weird pre-snap formation that looked like a spinning butthole, which is appropriate since they stretched their lead like the guy in the GOATS picture stretched his... Well, never mind. It was 24-3 at halftime, then 24-6 after 3, before KC put the finishing touches on with another touchdown run early in the 4th to go up 30 to six. Stidham said, fuck this, I'm leaving here with something. So he led a worthless touchdown drive capped off by a touchdown pass to first team all daughter dater, Hunter Renfro, to reach the final score of 31-13. Congrats to Mahomes on his second MVP. He now inherits the MVP curse, which means this season will inevitably lead to more heartbreak and depression for Chiefs fans. Happy New Year, everybody. Jacksonville versus Tennessee. A battle to see which team could win the AFC South, which is like bragging about beating somebody with no legs in a 40-yard dash. It looked like the tits of Tennessee would manage to sneak into the dance after they jumped out to a 10-0 lead late in the first half, but Trevor Lawrence refused to take it lying down. No offense to Sarah J. He fired a 25-yard touchdown to make it 10-7 and a 13-7 game at halftime. In the third quarter, Lawrence badly overthrew a wide-open receiver that would have given Jacksonville a lead, but they had to settle for a field goal. Tennessee answered back with a field goal to make it 16-10, and really, Lawrence had Brady-esque luck the rest of the way. He punted on a drive down six, then his defense gave him a short field off of a Josh Dobbs interception, but he could only manage a field goal to make it 16-13. T-Law then had two more fourth quarter drives down three, but punted both times. But to top it all off, no offense to Nancy Reagan, his defense forced a strip sack fumble return touchdown for him to take a 20-16 lead with three minutes left. Jackson will then stop Tennessee on the final drive after Dobbs threw the ball 10 yards short of the sticks on fourth and 13 like a fucking moron. The Jaguars outscored Tennessee 10 to nothing in the fourth quarter to make the playoffs, despite Lawrence contributing zero net yards on six dropbacks. The Jags offense overall produced negative yardage in the fourth quarter. But you know what? I'm glad it happened. I don't want to see the boring ass 1960s offense Tennessee runs. Lawrence's playoff debut is way more exciting. Shout out to Dougie P and his visor that makes women weak in the knees. Minnesota versus Chicago. 1 p.m. Kirk Cousins going up against the worst team in the league. Oh, you bet your sweet ass the Vikings won. Especially since they were facing the Peterman. Minnesota jumped out to a 16-0 lead late in the first half thanks to a Kirk touchdown pass and a touchdown run before the Bears came out of hibernation temporarily with a 42-yard touchdown run to make it 16-6 at halftime. Minnesota then turned into Leonardo DiCaprio in the Covenant and killed the Bears with another touchdown run to go up 23-6. But the Peterman said not so fast and threw a touchdown to make it 23-13 entering the fourth. Minnesota kicked a 50-yard field goal to go up 26-13 on the first play of the fourth and the combination of Peterman and Tim Boyle were unable to lead Chicago to any points, sealing the 29-13 win for Minnesota and the first overall pick in the 2023 draft for Chicago. Chicago's biggest need is obviously quarterback, but unfortunately for them, there are no generational quarterback prospects in this upcoming draft, so I would not be shocked if they traded the first overall pick for multiple top picks instead. As for Minnesota, congrats on being the worst 13-4 and team ever. Although it's not the worst thing to be known as, I suppose. You could be a Lord of the Rings fan. Atlanta versus Tampa Bay. Only Tom Brady could play in a division so terrible that his team clinched it with a game left to play with an 8-8 eight eight record. This game was useless for both teams involved, so no sense in really dwelling much on it. Brady only played the first one and a half quarters, threw a bunch of checkdowns as expected, and left the game when it was 10-10. Brady finished the season with the most completions and attempts in any season in NFL history, which sounds great until you realize he finished just 47th all-time in passing yards and tied for 313th in passing touchdowns. The literal definition of quantity over quality. God, I can't believe this fucker's in the playoffs and I have to endure his shit for another month probably. The only real highlight of this game was a Blaine Gabbert touchdown pass to put Tampa up 17-10 at halftime. Atlanta then outscored Tampa 20-0 in the second half. Not even Florida Gators legend Kyle Trask was enough to rally the Bucks back for being down 10 in the fourth quarter. That's right, folks. I said it. Tom Brady is a better quarterback than Kyle Trask, and doggone it, Brady's better than Gabbert too. With this 30-17 win, Atlanta can finally say they've beaten Tom Brady, but we all know it doesn't really count, just like Steph Curry's first three titles. Desmond Ritter has done just enough to warn 
warrant another look next year, in my opinion. Miami versus the Jets. It's actually refreshing when a game between two shitty quarterbacks like Skylar Thompson and Joe Flacco actually lives up to the hype of being as bad as everybody expected it to be. Unlike most games between terrible quarterbacks, however, this one had playoff implications. The game had 17 possessions, zero of which resulted in touchdowns, nine ended in punts, five ended in field goals, one ended in a turnover on downs, and one ended in a missed field goal. Oh yeah, the last possession ended in a fumble safety for Miami after a botched last hurrah play by the helicopters. It wasn't as bad as Jacoby Myers, but it was still embarrassing. Miami is now in the playoffs for just the third time in the last 21 years, and just the fifth time since Dan Marino retired. It's going to be great watching them go one and done again. As for the Jets, well, they're the Jets, and all their players and fans are damned to eternal suffering thanks to Joe Namath selling a soul to the devil for the 1968 Super Bowl, but you all knew that already, didn't you? Carolina versus New Orleans. Another game between two teams with nothing to play for, but that doesn't mean there still weren't some memorable moments. This game had 20 possessions. That's right, folks. These two teams combined for 17 points on 20 possessions. An absolute shit show of a game. However, it did have impact on one long-standing debate. LeBron James has been on a tear lately in his 20th season, and Michael Jordan got so pissed off about it, he decided to sign with the Carolina Panthers and recovered a San Darnold fumble in the end zone for a touchdown in the third quarter to tie the game at seven. Just when I thought the NBA GOAT debate was over, MJ goes and does something like this. What a competitor. Anyway, Darnold won this game with a passer rating of 2.8. Anytime a quarterback wins an NFL game with a passer rating that could double for my college GPA, chances are he's 2006 Rex Grossman, but not this time. To make it better, Darnold got credited with a game-winning drive for his efforts, thanks to a 13-yard run and 21-yard pass on the final drive to set up the 42-yard game-winning field goal to win 10-7. Pittsburgh versus Cleveland. For the first time since Ben Roethlisberger's final home game last year, Steelers fans welcomed a legendary woman-respecting quarterback to Heinz Field. Yeah, I know they changed the name, and no, I don't care. I can't imagine how comfortable Grover Cleveland felt in Pittsburgh, continuing on the AFC North tradition of producing quarterbacks that make women feel safe. Neither team put any points on the board until Deshaun Weinstein found David Njoku to go up 7-0, but Kenny Pickett activated his kitten mitten powers and found George Pickens for a score to tie it. Deshaun Cosby then threw an interception that set Pittsburgh up with a field goal to take a 10-7 halftime lead. Pittsburgh went up 13-7, then D. Kelly got picked off again for putting his balls in an unwanted area, which led to Pittsburgh going up 20-7 after three. Deshaunerable discharge then threw a touchdown to Nick Chubb to make it 20-14. I'm certainly not shocked to see Deshaun touchdown there, Watson scoring with a Chubb. Sicko. Anyway, Kitten Mittens then led Pittsburgh on a long touchdown drive, capped off by a touchdown run by the non-famous Watt brother to make it 28-14 with 437 left. Deshaun Watts under the towel then led one last drive and converted a few third and fourth downs, but it ended with him fittingly getting sacked like a little bitch by Cameron Hayward. Pittsburgh might have missed the playoffs, thankfully, but Mike Tomlin's non-losing season streak continues. Gosh, if only they had played in the NFC South. Houston versus Indianapolis. All the Texans had to do to earn the first overall pick in the draft was lose this game. Pretty simple, right? Considering they've shown the ability to lose 13 times already this year. But Lovey Smith and the rest of the players didn't get the memo, as they jumped out to a 17-7 halftime lead and a 24-14 lead late in the third. It was at this point that Houston owner Cal McNair probably pulled Davis Mills and Lovey Smith aside like the warden did to Adam Sandler in the longest yard, demanding they throw the game or suffer the consequences. And that's what happened initially. Mills threw a pick six and another interception on back-to-back drives to put Indy up 28-24. Houston punted and Indy expanded the lead to 31-24 with 3.33 left. It was at this point that Lovey Smith said, fuck these bitches are going to fire me anyway, they did, and told Mills to go win the fucking game. So Mills promptly moved Houston down the field and converted a 4th and 12 with a 30-yard pass, but the best was yet to come, as on 4th and 20, Mills threw up a prayer to the end zone that somehow went through the Indy DB's hands and into his wide receiver for a touchdown to make it 31-30 with 50 seconds left. Houston then went for two like real men and converted it to take a 32-31 lead. Diet Baker Mayfield couldn't get anything going on Indy's final drive, and Houston won, ending both the Lovey Smith era in Houston and the Jeff Saturday era in Indy simultaneously. Buffalo versus New England. The Bills were obviously playing with extra emotion following DeMar Hamlin's nearly fatal accident last week, and it immediately showed, as Naheem Hines returned the opening kickoff 96 yards for a score. But despite Buffalo coming out emotionally charged, the Patriots actually weathered the storm pretty well for two and a half quarters, taking a 17-14 lead with seven minutes left in the third. Then, Hines returned another kickoff for a score to go up 21-17. Then a little while later, Josh Allen threw a 40-yard strike to John Brown to go up 28-17, but New England still wouldn't go away for good, answering back with a Mac Jones touchdown pass to Devontae Parker to make it 28-23 with 
12 minutes left. But the play that sealed the game for Buffalo was Allen finding Stephon Diggs for a 49-yard touchdown on 3rd and 10 to go up 35-23 with 9 minutes left. Buffalo muffed a punt, but Jones threw an interception on that possession and the last possession to seal the win for Buffalo and New England's second losing season in three years since Tom Brady left. I know I say this a lot, but it must be said. It is fitting of Brady's luck that the Bills were dog shit for the 20 years he was there, and the moment he leaves, they immediately become a juggernaut, and their quarterback goes from being mid to all pro. The Pats finished 8-9 and nine and missed the playoffs. Too bad they didn't play in the NFC South, or else they'd get a home playoff game. Fun little stat here. In Tom Brady's 324 starts with New England, they gave up just three kickoff return touchdowns, but in this win and in game, they gave up two kickoff return touchdowns. Brady's luck will never be seen again. Again, I know I say it all the time, but there's just so much evidence of it out there, I can't help but show it to you. As for Buffalo, they now get the two seed and would get a neutral field in the AFC Championship game if they face the Chiefs. The Hamlin situation was unprecedented and Buffalo didn't ask for this, obviously, and it's great to see Hamlin is alive and doing well. But if we are strictly keeping it to on-the-field matters in the aftermath of the unprecedented Hamlin situation, there's no question the league has gone out of their way to help Buffalo while tossing Cincy aside. If Buffalo wins the Super Bowl, will there be an asterisk on it? In my opinion, yes. But I won't care, because that means Tom Brady didn't win. But fuck all of that. All that really matters is Damar Hamlin being alive and well. We're happy to have you back, Damar. Cincinnati versus Baltimore. With Lamar Jackson once again out, a situation which isn't getting nearly enough attention, in my opinion, in regards to his free agency, since he had little trouble rolling over the Anthony Brown-led Ravens at home, taking a 10-0 lead after one on amateur boxer Joe Mixon's touchdown run. Joe Burrow then found college buddy Jamar Chase for a touchdown to go up 17-0. Baltimore finally woke up with a touchdown run to make it 17-7, but a Cincy fumble recovery off of a strip sack in the end zone with 30 seconds left in the first half to make it 24-7 Cincy essentially ended the game. The entire second half consisted of nothing but field goals and sadness to seal the 27-16 win for Cincy. I must say that I did not expect Cincy to continue their success after their lucky Super Bowl run last year. But they are legit and might have been robbed of the two seed thanks to the Buffalo game being canceled. As for Baltimore, if Lamar doesn't play in their playoff game, I think that will officially confirm that we've seen the last of him in a Ravens uniform, and if that's the case, Baltimore is in deep shit for the foreseeable future. San Francisco versus Arizona. San Fran has been the best team in the league since November, reeling off nine straight wins heading into this game against a team starting its fourth string quarterback and a lame duck coach. It went about as you'd expect, although Arizona did take a 6-0 lead early off of a 77-yard touchdown pass from David Blau, my wife's back out, to A.J. Green's corpse. San Fran was not phased, as not Jimmy Garoppolo threw a touchdown pass to Christian, will have your daughter home by 10, McCaffrey. San Fran then scored on a touchdown run to go up 14-6, but Arizona responded with a touchdown of their own to make it 14-13 temporarily before Jimmy G's replacement found Greg Kittle to make it 21-13 at halftime. And from there, it was smooth sailing for San Fran. Arizona got blanked in the second second half while the 49ers piled it on to win 38-13. In the final game of J.J. Watt's Hall of Fame career, he had two sacks, showing he could still play well if he wanted to for a couple more seasons, while also making one wonder just how many more sacks he could have racked up had three or four seasons of his prime not been completely wiped out by injury. Cliff Kingsbury got fired after the game, a move which will cause the Cardinals' female attendance numbers to drop precipitously next season, but overall, it is for the best. Philadelphia versus the Giants. Considering New Jersey was playing all their backups, I would have had a cow if my Eagles choked away the shot at the one seed at home. Jalen Hurts returned, and although he had his moments, he did not look like the same Hurts from before the injury. Still, all that matters now is the win, and Philly took a 19-0 lead before New Jersey scored on a field goal late in the third. Things got somewhat spooky in the fourth, as Davis Webb ran for a score deceptively to make it 19-9, but Hurts led a clutch 15-play, 7-minute long field goal drive to put Philly up 13 with 3.21 left. But New Jersey wasn't done yet. They scored a touchdown on a lucky prayer throw by Webb to legalize bank robbing expert Kenny Galladay to make it 22-16 with a minute 38 left. But Philly thankfully recovered the onside kick to seal the win and the one seed. Hopefully these two weeks of rest help Hurts get back to early season form or else Philly is in legit trouble. Oh Jesus, we're gonna lose to Tom Brady in the divisional round, aren't we? Fuck. Washington versus Dallas. Dallas had a very slim chance of entering this game, getting the one seed, and the entire team played like it, treating this game as if it was meaningless. And in a way, it was. Even even if they did win, they would still have to travel to Tom Brady's castle of dark magic in Tampa. But still, really guys? Getting blown out by 20 points to a rookie making his first career start? That rookie, Sam Howell, looks like how a drunk person would draw Baker Mayfield. Dak had an atrocious game, completing under 38% of his throws and a pick six. I am hoping Dallas got all of their shit plays out of their system in this game before facing Brady next Monday night, but trusting the Cowboys in a big game
game is like trusting Bernie Madoff to handle your money responsibly. We can now put Washington as another team with a better winning percentage in Tampa Bay that didn't make the playoffs. Shame. Seattle versus the Rams. In what was probably Sean McVay's final game as Rams coach before he officially runs from the grind of a long rebuild, the Rams put up a decent fight, but their lost season ended as you'd expect, with a loss. Duh. Seattle, meanwhile, was still fighting for a chance to make the playoffs, but the first half saw the Rams take a 13-6 lead into halftime. Pro bowler Geno Smith then found Tyler Lockett on a 36-yard dime to tie it at 13. LA would take a 16-13 lead after three, but Seattle answered back with a field goal to tie it at 16 with 219 left. Utterly distraught over the lack of cheesecake factories in Seattle, Baker Mayfield failed to lead LA on a game-winning drive, but Geno got the ball back and quickly set up a game-winning 46-yard field goal attempt as time expired, but it was missed, sending the game into overtime. Seattle got the ball first, but punted. Then, after learning Seattle did in fact have a cheesecake factory nearby, Baker threw an interception and left the stadium immediately, setting up Seattle with another game-winning field goal attempt, this time from 32 yards away, and this time it was good to give Seattle a 19-16 win and a playoff berth following Green Bay's massive choke job. Denver versus the Chargers. Another game where neither team had anything to play for except pride. It was tightly contested. Justin Herbert threw a couple first-half touchdown passes, but Denver responded with multiple touchdowns of their own, including a Gus Fring touchdown pass with 10 seconds left in the first half to tie it at 17 at halftime. Fring threw a go-ahead touchdown early in the third, and Denver would never trail again, although LA added a field goal and was driving down 24-20 late in the third when DeAndre Carter fumbled. Fring threw his third touchdown of the day to put Denver up 31-20, and LA finally sat Herbert for the legendary Chase Daniel, a professional football player who has become famous for how much money he's made for not playing professional football. Daniel actually led a touchdown drive and two-point conversion to make it 31-28 with six minutes left, and he even got the ball back down three with a chance to tie the game or win it, but the future first bout Hall of Fame quarterback went three and out. Denver then converted a couple first downs to seal the win. Will Denver throw the bag at tiny quarterback whisperer Sean Payton to help fix Wilson? We shall see. As for LA, I'm happy to see Herbert in the playoffs as long as they let him actually throw deep instead of treating him like he's Chad Pennington. Detroit versus Green Bay. While this technically wasn't a playoff game, it might as well have been, considering Aaron Rodgers and the Packers completely choked away a massive opportunity at home. I really believe, even though he was mostly shit all year, that Rodgers would find a way to do away with the Lions at home like he has so many times before with ease, and it just didn't happen. Green Bay drops forced them to settle for field goals early instead of touchdowns, but the biggest swing came on an Aaron Jones fumble late in the first half, on a drive that either probably would have ended with Green Bay winning 12-3 or 16-3 at halftime. Instead, Detroit added a field goal before half to make it 9-6. Took a 13-9 lead on a Jamal Williams touchdown run before Rodgers finally showed some signs of life, leading an impressive touchdown drive with a touchdown pass to Alan Lazard to go up 16-13 entering the fourth quarter. But then it happened again. Just as it did in the fourth quarter of the 2020 NFC Championship game versus Tampa and the 2021 Divisional Round last year versus San Francisco, Rodgers crapped his pants. He had the ball up 16-13 in the fourth, but had to punt. Then Detroit went on a long touchdown drive to go up 20-16 with 5.55 left in the game. Rodgers got a first down, but then threw three straight incompletions, the last one being an arm punt interception to end the drive. He would never get the ball again as Detroit ran out the rest of the clock with help from a fluke catch and a ballsy fourth and one conversion. Rodgers went two for six for 12 yards and an interception in the fourth quarter. The biggest quarter of the season and for the third straight year, he choked in it. It hurts as a Rodgers fan, but these recent losses have stained his legacy. Yes, as I said, he suffered multiple drops and there was the Jones fumble and his defense didn't show up in the fourth quarter, but you're the superstar quarterback and future Hall of Famer. At some point, it's up to you to get shit done and Rodgers just has not done enough in big moments to be the GOAT. This game was winnable, just like the 2020 NFC Championship game and 2021 Divisional Round were, and he choked. All at home. Was this his last game in the NFL? Maybe. Either way, whenever Rodgers is done playing for good, he will have to settle for being a top 5-10 to 10 quarterback ever, which is disappointing to anybody who watched him dominate the Steelers in the Super Bowl at just 27 years old to win a ring and Super Bowl MVP. He then followed that up with arguably the best and most impressive eye test regular season by any quarterback ever in 2011, and at that point, the chances of him winning three to four rings and being considered the GOAT by his career end were almost certain, much like how people talk about Mahomes now. But it didn't turn out that way. Brady stole all the GOAT talk and most of the rings. Now Rodgers will be remembered as an all-time great quarterback who should have won more, like Marino, Breeze, and Peyton. Is it totally fair? No, it never really is. But the fact is, he did not live up to his natural talent in big games as much as he should have outside of 2010. And that's something he'll have to live with for the rest of his life. As for Detroit, they are another team that won more than Tampa Bay that will miss the playoffs. Don't you dare click out of this video, you bastard. It
It's puppy time and you will like it.